Today we are going to discuss the topic of seepage. Well, if you just look at the one dimensional flow, uh, particularly this case, when the water is flowing through a conduit, the conduit which has been filled with the soil, so you are able to see the two sections, section A and the section B, and uh, over there you can see the elevation head, the pressure head, and the total head at section A is HA, and the total head at section B is HRB. You know, as the speed or the flow velocity is extremely low through the soil mass, so velocity head can be neglected. Moreover, discharge is equal to V into A, or you can say the discharge is equal to K times I into A, where I is the hydraulic gradient that is H over L. So here, this V is the velocity of flow, and A is the area of the flow. That is the area perpendicular to the direction of velocity. Moreover, you can see the one dimensional flow through this model. So basically, the head loss or the head difference or the energy loss is equal to HA minus HP in this case. As far as the two-dimensional flow is concerned, that can be modeled through such flow lines. And you can see the impervious boundary over here. This is the level of water on the upstream side. This is the level of water on the downstream side. So this is delta H or simply you can say H, which is the head loss causing flow or head causing flow. Here you can see the flow lines. These are the flow lines and uh, dotted lines you can see these are the equipotential lines. So on. Laplace equation of continuity. <clears throat> in reality, the flow of water through soil is not in one direction only, nor is it uniform over the entire area perpendicular to the flow. The flow of water in two dimensional is described using Laplace equation. Laplace, Laplace equation is the combination of the equation of continuity and the Darcy's law. Considering the Laplace equation of continuity, ultimately we are getting this equation. And in the case of isotropic soil, isotropic soil is that one in which we are having the same property in the different directions. So ultimately, you will be getting this equation. So this is the Laplace equation. This equation governs the steady flow condition for a given point in the soil mass. Now look at the flow nets. Flow nets are a graphical solution method of Laplace equation for 2D flow in a homogeneous isotropic aquifer. In an isotropic medium, the continuity equation represents two orthogonal families of curves, flow lines and equipotential lines. So these are the two important lines, flow lines. The flow line is the line along which a water particle will travel 
from upstream to the downstream side in the permeable soil medium. As far as the equipotential line is concerned, the line along which the potential or you can say the pressure head at all points is equal. So it would not be wrong to say that flow nets are the combination of flow lines and equipotential lines. To complete the graphic construction of a flow net, one must draw flow and equipotential line in such way that the equipotential lines intersect the flow lines at right angles. The flow elements formed are approximate squares. Now in this figure you can see that this is the sheet pile, this is the upstream side and the level of water is this one and the downstream side this is the water level. So H1 on upstream side, H2 on the downstream side. So you can see that uh, this is one flow line, this is another, this is the next one. Impervious boundaries also considered as the flow line. So keeping this thing in the mind. So N sub F is the number of flow channels in the flow net. N sub D is the number of potential drops. So you can see here, this is one flow channel. This is another flow channel. This is another flow channel. And this is another flow channel. And uh, you can see the flow line. This is one flow line. This is second one. This is the third one. And the fourth one would be the impervious boundary. That would also be considered as the impervious line. Uh, that would be also be considered as the flow line. And uh, you can see the dotted lines. These are the equipotential lines. Flow net drawing technique. Draw to a convenient scale the geometry of the problem. Establish constant head and no flow boundary conditions and draw flow and equipotential line near boundaries. Constant head boundaries, water levels, represent initial or final equipotentials. Impermeable, no flow boundaries or flow lines. I have already mentioned this thing. Next step is sketch flow lines by smooth curves, three to five flow lines. Flow lines should not intersect each other or impervious boundary. Next step, draw equipotential lines by smooth curve adhering to right angle intersections and square grid condition. So aspect ratio is equal to one. Next step, continue sketching and readjusting until you get square almost everywhere. Successive trials will result in a reasonably consistent flow net. So here you can see the flow net in this particular case and here you can see the flow net in this particular case. <clears throat> Well, you can see that uh, this is the flow line, this is another flow line, this is another flow line. So, you can see here in this case, the coefficient of permeability is same in vertical and the horizontal direction. So, you can say the isotropic soil is being considered. Now, number of flow lines. Uh, flow channel, number of flow channels, N sub F, these are four. How is it four? This is first one, this is the second one, this is the third one, and this is the fourth one. And the number of uh, equipotential lines, equipotential drops, you can see one, two, three, four, five, and six. So Number of equipotential drops, six, and number of flow channels are four. Here you can see again. So you can see this is 
first flow channel this is second one this is the third one and this is the fourth one so four number of flow channels four so region between the flow line that is called as the flow channel and n sub d that means the number of equipotential drops so one two three four five and six so here you can see this is the flow delta q which is being taken place in this channel flow channel and uh, you can see the equipotential line this one where the head is h1 here the another equipotential line where the head is h2 so the head lost between equipotential that is delta h that is equal to h1 minus h2 over here and you can see that uh, by having this square you can see that uh, this dimension a is almost equal to this b here you can see this thing in, an, in another way you can see the equipotential lines having the heads h1 h2 and h3 respectively and this is one flow line this is another flow line and uh, this one is considered as the flow channel and again you can see this is this dimension is capital L and this is L so both dimensions are almost same in this case so you can see that discharge in flow direction that is delta Q per flow channel so in this flow channel we are having the discharge delta Q now look at this particular figure you can see the firm lines representing the flow lines and the dotted line the equipotential lines so normally we give the number uh, like that this is the bed it will be considered as zero if this number uh, zero number will be given to that this is having one this is two three four and so on and you can see this is the 16th equipotential line and then this one the bed it will be considered as 17 so we are having the 17 equipotential line in this case seepage calculation flow from flow net in a flow net the strip between any two adjacent flow lines is called flow channel i have already mentioned this thing the drop in the total head between any two adjacent equipotential lines is called potential drop if the ratio of the sides of flow element are the same along flow channel then rate of flow through the flow channel per unit width perpendicular to the flow direction is the same so delta q1 is equal to delta q2 that is equal to delta q3 and so on and you can say that is equal to delta q second condition the potential drop is the same and equal to h1 minus h2 that is equal to h2 minus h3 that is equal to h3 minus h4 or you can write it like that that this is capital H over N sub D where H is the head difference between the upstream and downstream sides and N sub D that is the number of potential drops uh, this uh, this can also be denoted by N sub EQ so N sub EQ or N sub D that's the same thing that is the number of potential drops So from the Darcy's equation, the rate of flow is equal to delta Q is equal to KIA. So I can be replaced by H1 minus H2 over L1 in this case. Here H2 minus H3 divided by L2 and so on like this. So you can refer this equation to this diagram to understand that. And this can be replaced by this. Delta Q is equal to K times H into 1 over N sub T where the n sub d the number of equipotential drops if the number of flow channel in a flow net is equal to n sub f 
the total rate of flow through all the channels per unit length can be given by q is equal to k times h over n f over n sub d now here look at this one this example if the coefficient of permeability is 10 raised per minus 7 meter per second what would be the flow per day over a hundred meter length of wall so look at that 50 meter of water 5 meter on the downstream side and you can see this is a dam and a cut of wall has been provided over here so you can see the blue color flow lines and you can see impervious bed will also be considered as the flow line and then you can see the eco potential lines in red colors over here now in this case the n sub f is equal to 5 n sub d is equal to 14 delta h that is equal to 45 meter that is the head causing flow or difference of levels of water that you are having on the upstream side and on the downstream side coefficient of permeability is given so we are going to use this formula simply and uh, in this way you can get ultimately by involving 100 meter length that is perpendicular to the figure so you are getting the discharge that is 0.00161 cubic meter per second or you can say that it's 13.9 cubic meter per day now this slide is very important total head if you want to know the total head at any particular point within the soil that is equal to h sub l minus number of drops from upstream into delta h where this delta h can be replaced by h l over n sub d this can also be written as number of drops from downstream into delta h so you will have to memorize this formula i will repeat total head is equal to hl minus number of drops from upstream into delta h or it is equal to number of drops from downstream into delta h where this delta h is equal to hl over n sub d elevation head that is minus z in this case because we are considering this point x and the pressure head that is equal to total head minus elevation head so you will have to memorize these concepts to determine the pressure head at any point so in this case you can see the datum is being considered over here that is the level of water on the downstream side so this x point is lying below dot datum so it is minus z so when you are <coughs> considering any point uh, present below the datum negative sign will be used and uh, when you are considering some point which is present above the datum positive sign will be used when you are considering the elevation head so pressure head is equal to total head minus elevation head Now in this case the uplift pressure under hydraulic structure now look at this case we are having this hydraulic structure and we are going to consider point A, point B, point C, D, E and F and uh, at point A the pressure head that is U sub A over gamma W that is equal to 7 into 1 into 1 minus minus 2 because you can see the datum is this one and this point A is situated at a distance of 2 meter below the datum so that's why minus sign is there so it is coming 8 meter 
so simply by using the formula of the pressure head that I have discussed uh, in the previous slide we have got it the uplift pressure or simply the pressure head at point A similarly at point B the U sub uh, well this is a pressure head or the uplift pressure at point B so better to use U sub B this is not A this is U sub B over gamma W so you can see it is 7 minus 2 into 1 minus minus 2 so it is 7 meter similarly at point F so it is better to use U sub F over gamma W that is 7 minus 6 into 1 minus minus 2 so it is 3 meter so in this way you can get the uplift pressure under hydraulic structures at different points A, B, C, D, E, F and ultimately you can plot this diagram showing the uplift pressure. So in fact in this we have considered delta H the delta H that I considered on the previous slide that is equal to HL over N sub D. So HL is equal to 7 meter you can see that uh, this is the level of water on the downstream side this is the level that is on the upstream side so obviously 7 meter is that sub L. As far as the equip number of equipotential drops are concerned you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 so we are having 7 uh, number of equipotential drops so that's why 7 over 7 is equal to 1 so that's why 1 is there. and isotropic soils these are the soils in which the properties are different in different directions so here you can say that the coefficient of probability is not same in, in all directions uh, or you can simply say that uh, kx that is the coefficient of probability in the horizontal direction is not equal to kz that is the coefficient of probability in the vertical direction so just by considering the Laplace equation and uh, modifying it for the anisotropic uh, an, an isotropic soils uh, we can write this equation like this and uh, the steps involved to draw the flow net in the case of uh, an, an isotropic soils the step number one is adopt a vertical scale that is z axis for drawing the cross section step two adopt a horizontal scale that is x-axis such that vertical scale is equal to the square root of kz over kx into horizontal scale whereas this kz is the coefficient of probability in the vertical direction kx the coefficient of probability in the horizontal direction step 3 with scales adopted as in steps 1 and 2 plot the vertical section through the permeable layer parallel to the direction of flow step 4 draw the flow net for the permeable layer on the section obtained from step 3 uh, with flow lines intersecting equipotential potential lines at right angles and the elements as approximate squares if we draw the flow net on the true section the lines are not at right angles to each other as in transform section so in the step 2 basically we are considering the transform section and uh, on that transform section the flow net is to be drawn in this case steps for constructing flow net in an, an isotropic soil horizontal scale for transform section that is x and the vertical scale for transform section is z and in the true section we are considering the horizontal scale x dash and uh, the vertical scale as z dash so x dash that is equal to the square root of kz divided by kx multiplied by x and this can be replaced by alpha so alpha is equal to the square root of kz over 
kx. So you can say that uh, x dash is equal to alpha times x. And uh, keep this thing in the mind that x dash is equal to z dash and uh, z dash is equal to z. There is no change for the vertical scale. Either you are considering the transform section or true section. So then you can get the rate of flow per unit length by using this formula where you can see that the equivalent coefficient of permeability which is equal to this the square root of kz multiplied by kx this would be multiplied by h that is the head causing flow into n sub f over n sub d and you are familiar with n sub f the number of flow channels and number of equipotential drops On this slide, you can see the transform section and this is the true section. So in the transform section, you know, you will have to modify the horizontal scale. We have already discussed that uh, horizontal scale on the previous slide. So here you can see in this example, the ratio between the vertical coefficient of permeability and the horizontal coefficient of permeability that is kz over kx that is equal to 1 over 6. So in this case the vertical scale which is being used that is equal to 20 feet that means this much length is equal to 20 feet and uh, for the horizontal scale by using the strategy which is mentioned on the previous slide you can see that 20 multiplied by square root of 6 that is coming equal to 49 feet so it means for the horizontal uh, scale uh, we are going to consider this much length meant for 49 feet and here this is the true section and you can see one thing uh, in fact uh, this is mentioned in the note uh, that when the flow nets are drawn in transform section in an isotropic soil the flow lines and equipotential lines are orthogonal so look at this case in the transform section where we have modified the horizontal scale so this is the transform section here the flow lines and the dotted equipotential lines are perpendicular to each other orthogonal to each other however when they are redrawn in true section these lines are not at uh, right angles in, to each other this fact is shown in figure 8.8 you can see this one this is a figure 8.8 this is B and this is A this is the transform section and this is the true section so these things uh, will be more cleared when we will be discussing the problem, the solved problem related to this topic. Now look at this uh, example. A dam section is shown in figure 8.9a. The hydraulic conductivity of the permeable layer in the vertical and horizontal directions are 2 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 millimeter per second and 4 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 millimeter per second respectively. Draw a flow net and calculate the seepage loss of the dam in cubic feet per day per foot. From the given data, you know Kz that is equal to this one. This can be converted into feet per day. Kx that is 4 into 10 raised to the power minus 2 in millimeter per second and this is into 11.34 feet per day you can say. Okay, if you just look at this one. Well, you can see that uh, if we just draw the hydraulic structure considering the same scale 
along horizontal and vertical axis. So we are having this case, okay? And when we use the concept that we have discussed for the anisotropic soil, horizontal scale will be equal to 25 into square root of 2, and that is 36.36 and uh, vertical scale will be the same one that we have adopted over here. So in this way, we have just modified the horizontal axis. So you can see actually this dimension was this one, but as in this case, this much length is showing 35.36 feet, not 25. So that's why you can see here we are having this small dimension as compared to this one. Now, once you have done this thing, you have sketched your hydraulic structure like that, and uh, you have shown the thickness of the permeable layer and uh, the level. Now, it's time to draw the flow line and the equipotential lines. So, this is basically the transformed section that we have sketched for this particular case. And now by using this, we will be able to determine the seepage. And uh, H is equal to 20 feet in this case. That is the difference of levels of the water surfaces on the upstream and the downstream sides. Uh, for drawing the flow net, vertical scale is equal to the square root of coefficient of probability in the vertical direction divided by the coefficient of probability in the horizontal direction. So this is Kz and this is Kx multiplied by horizontal scale. So obviously this is 1 over square root of 2 into horizontal scale. So in this way horizontal scale will be equal to square root of 2 multiplied by vertical scale and in this way you know you can determine the horizontal scale on the basis of this the dam section is replotted and uh, the flow net drawn on uh, as in figure 8.9b that i have already showed on the previous slide the rate of seepage is given by q is equal to the square root of kx into kz. In fact, this is uh, k equivalent into h multiplied by nf over nd. From figure 8.9b, which was present on the previous slide, n sub d, number of uh, equipotential drops, they are equal to 8, and uh, number of flow channels, 2.5. So this is an interesting thing. The lower most flow channel has a width to length ratio 0.5 so that's why it is 2.5 so by using the formula of the q that is the rate of flow per unit length or per unit width so just by plugging the values we have got the answer 50.12 cubic feet per day per foot Okay, now look at uh, one example over here of dam failure. So, uh, around 7 a.m. on June 5th, 1976, a leak about 30 meters from the top of Teton Dam was observed. Look at that, this is the leak point. And uh, look at that, what has happened? At 11.59 uh, a.m., the dam broke. And you had the failure of this dam. Post failure investigation revealed that seepage causing piping and internal erosion. So that was the main cause. Seepage through rock opening, hydraulic fracture, differential settlement and cracking, settlement in bedrock. So piping in granular soils at the downstream near the dam, the exit 
hydraulic gradient that is I sub exit is equal to delta H over delta L. So you can see that delta L is this one and delta H is the total head drop between the two equipotential lines. If hydraulic gradient at exit exceeds the critical hydraulic gradient I sub C, first the soil grains at exit get washed away. This phenomenon progresses towards the upstream forming a free passage of water that is called as pipe. So look at that, what is happening? It is propagating towards the upstream side. So you are not having any soil, so all water, so water will be flowing only in this region. Critical hydraulic gradient. The critical hydraulic gradient I sub C, that is uh, gamma dash over gamma W. Here, this is the submerged unit weight or the buoyant unit weight which is equal to saturated unit weight minus unit weight of water. So using the expressions for the submerged unit weight over here, you can get this formula. Specific gravity of soil solids minus 1 over 1 plus E, that is the void ratio E. So consequences. When the soil has attained the critical hydraulic gradient, it means no stresses to hold granular soils together and soil may flow and uh, in that case you can use the term boiling or piping that is basically portraying the erosion. So piping in granular soils, piping is a very serious problem. It leads to downstream flooding which can result in loss of lives. Therefore provide adequate safety factor against piping and the factor of safety against piping that should be more than three. So critical hydraulic gradient divided by exit hydraulic gradient that uh, must be greater than or equal to three at least. Now filters. Filters are used for facilitating drainage, preventing fines from being washed away. Used in earthen dams, retaining walls, and if you just look at the filter materials, we are using the granular soils and the geotextiles. So granular filter design, the proper design of filter should satisfy two conditions. Condition one, the size of wires in the filter material should be small enough to hold the larger, relatively larger particles of the protected material in place. Condition two, the filter material should have a high hydraulic conductivity to prevent buildup of large seepage forces and hydrostatic pressures in the filter. So you can see this is the dam cross section and the, here we have provided the granular filter. There are different uh, criterias which uh, can be used for the designing of filters. Uh, according to Tazagi and Pack, D15 of filter over D85 of soil should be less than or equal to 4 to 5. And for the second condition that we discussed on the previous slide, D15 of filter material over D15 of soil that should be greater than or equal to 4 to 5. Similarly, as per US Navy 1971 criteria, these conditions are to be fulfilled. So grain size distribution curves for the soil and filter must be parallel. That is the basic point that we consider in the granular filter design. Now, if we consider the Terzaghi's approach, so you can see that uh, this is the grain size distribution curve of the soil, the soil which is to be protected. So from this uh, you can get uh, D15 of this soil and D85 of this soil. This is very easy because you can see corresponding to 85. This is the size so this is D85 of that soil. 
corresponding to 15% passing this one. So you are getting this much side that is day 15 of the soil. Okay, now just calculate five times of D85 of S and try to mark this point and four times, uh, five times of D15 of the soil and try to mark this point. And then from this point and this point, draw a curve, this one, which is almost parallel to this grain size distribution curve of the original soil. Now, from this particular point, move in the downward direction and just corresponding to this point, try to locate this particular point. Now, from this point, draw this curve. This is also almost parallel to the previous curve. So this band that you are having, if you, are, if you have chosen the filter material to protect this particular soil, I will repeat that if the filter materials grain size distribution curve is falling somewhere on this band, so you can treat that filter material as a good filter material. So in this way, you know, we can design the granular filter for the hydraulic structures. Now here you would find the example, which is a solid example, a stiff clay layer underlies a 12 meter thick silty sand deposit. A sheet pile is driven into the sand to a depth of seven meter and the upstream and downstream water levels are as shown in the figure on the next slide. Permeability of the silty sand is 8.6 into 10 to the power minus four centimeter per second. The stiff clay can be assumed to be impervious. The void ratio of the silty sand is 0.72 and the specific gravity of the grains is 2.65. Part A. Estimate the CPI beneath the sheet pile in cubic meter per day per meter. Part B. What is the pore water pressure at the tip of the sheet pile? C. Is the arrangement safe against piping? So look at this one. So you can see this is the sheet pile, the flow lines and uh, equipotential lines have been drawn. And you can see the tip is situated at a seven meter from the bed that you are having on the downstream side. Or you can see it is nine meter from the level of water that you are having on the downstream side. And if you just look at this one, this dimension is 2.6 meter. Now on this particular slide, you would find the solution part A. So considering the figure, the figure that I showed on the previous diagram, number of flow channels three, number of eco potential drops eight, delta is three meter, so we can calculate the discharge and by using this formula, by plugging the values and then ultimately converting into cubic meter per day per meter, you are getting this answer. For part B, taking downstream water level as a datum, at the tip of the sheet pile, the total head. You know, we discussed the formula of the total head that is coming equal to 1.5 meter. Actually it is three minus into four into three by eight, or you can say that is equal to four into three by eight. So referring to the figure and by employing the concept of the total head or by using the formula of the total head, you can get it equal to 1.5 meter. Elevation head it is minus nine meter here in this case, so the pressure head is equal to 1.5 minus minus nine, so it is equal to 10.5 meter. So obviously the pore water pressure that is equal to the pressure head multiplied by the unit weight of water, so that is equal to 103 kPa. Part C, solution, head loss per equipotential drop that is delta H that is equal to three by eight, that is 0.375 meter again, referring to the figure which is present on the previous slide. The maximum exit gradient, hydraulic gradient near the sheet pile, that is 0.375 divided by 2.6, that is 0.144. The critical hydraulic gradient can be calculated by using this formula, and that is coming 0.96. So 
so safety factor here it is 0.96 over 0.144 it is 6.7 and it is uh, more than 3 so the arrangement is quite safe with respect to piping you can conclude this thing over here okay so in this way we have discussed the important concepts related to the seepage now at the end of this lecture you would find some solved problems so you will have to go through these problems yourself this is the problem statement the figure and the discussion you would be finding on the next slide similarly another problem that you can see over here statement and then the figure is there and the solution on the next slide another problem first the statement then the figure and then the solution this is the next problem first the statement is given then you can see the figure and then the solution so in this way you would find a number of problems over here the solved problems and uh, this is next problem the statement is given on this particular slide and this is the figure portraying this particular problem and uh, here you would find the solution so basically here you would find the application of the basic concepts that we have considered or studied in this particular lecture so you will have to go through that all this is the next problem the solution is provided on the next slide and uh, this is the last problem which is related to backboard trench test to estimate the field permeability the statement and uh, this is the figure showing that arrangement and uh, here the solution so in this way you can go through these all problems and you could be able to enhance your concepts related to seepage so that's all about the seepage thank you